Justin Fields is gone. So what is Chicago going to do right now? The NBA and the play-in tournament. Plus your tweets, your calls, and some politicians getting on my last damn nerve. There's a whole bunch of stuff to discuss, and I'm here for it. The Stephen A. Smith Show. Let's go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you at least three times a week over the digital airwaves of YouTube. By the way, as always, I'm going to take a moment to show my love and appreciation for all of my followers. We continue to climb the charts and have exceeded over 589,000 subscribers. Can't thank y'all enough for the love, so keep it coming, and I'm going to keep on coming. Just remember to continue to like and follow the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on YouTube. Just click the bell to get notified for all of our new content, and boom, you will be the latest member of the Stephen A. Smith family. While you're out there doing that, please Please don't forget to pick up a copy of my New York Times best-selling book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. Now in paperback, just go to straightshooterbook.com. That's straightshooterbook.com to get yourself a copy. And since I am in studio, you know what that means. I'll be taking your call. So make sure to hit me up to get some advice or my response to some of y'all drivel at times at 888-727-5303. That's 888-SAS-53. Zero three. Now let's get this party started. To say that Caleb Williams' pro day was a big deal would be a gross understatement because it was carried live on the NFL Network this afternoon and streamed on NFL Plus. With the trade of Justin Fields, it seems that the Bears are all in on drafting Williams, number one overall. But you have football pundits like the one and only RG3 saying Williams should pull an Eli Manning a la 2004 and demand that he get traded, not picked up by the Chicago Bears. Remember, Eli Manning didn't want to go to the Chargers. Remember that? Here's what RG3 had to say about Williams and the Chicago Bears. Caleb Williams should pull a Eli Manning and demand that the Chicago Bears do not draft him number one overall. After everything that's happened with just Justin Fields, can Caleb Williams really look at that and say, you know what? This is the organization that has my best interest at heart and they're going to help develop me into the player that I want to become. Caleb Williams is on record saying that he wants to be legendary. He wants to rewrite history and he wants to be the best that he can possibly be and win the most games he can possibly win. After the Bears took Justin Fields, the 11th pick in the draft, and turned him into a sixth round pick in the 2025 draft by trading him to the Pittsburgh Steelers? Can Caleb Williams really look at that and say, you know what? Yeah, this organization is going to help get me where I want to go. Interesting take by the one and only RG3. Give respect where respect is due. Former star at Baylor, former Heisman Trophy winner, former number two overall pick in the NFL draft. A brother could ball, no question about it. If a Lodi Nada hadn't nearly, you know, amputated his leg with that hit that derailed his career, who knows what RG3 would still be doing in the NFL level. So mad respect to my colleague and friend. But I will say this, I respectfully disagree with him. And I respectfully disagree with him because I'm looking at some of the pieces at the Chicago Chicago Bears have acquired this offseason. First of all, you still got DJ Moore there. You acquired Keenan Allen from the Los Angeles Chargers, okay? You took that up, okay? And I'm looking at DeAndre Swift that was in Philadelphia last year that I thought did a pretty damn good job running the football. And I'm saying to myself, excuse me, if you're Caleb Williams, you do have some weapons in Chicago. And remember, this is in the days of Ryan Pace who passed up on a Patrick Mahomes and a Deshaun Watson to move up multiple spots in the draft to get number two overall pick, Mitchell Jabitsky for crying out loud. This is what the hell the Chicago Bears once did. This is Ryan Pohl's regime now. So I say give the brother a chance. You're moving in a different direction. There's nothing wrong with it if Caleb Williams is all that people are proclaiming him to be then it's something that you should take a chance on. Not to mention the fact he's playing with house money. The best quarterback in the history of the Chicago Bears franchise has been Jim McMahon back in 1985 when they were the dance of Bears. We are the Bears, the shuffling crew. Shuffle on down, do it for you. Remember that boring ass song? But they were elite because their defense was no joke. They had Mike Ditka as the head coach, they had Buddy Ryan as the defensive coordinator, and when they won the Super Bowl by trouncing the New England Patriots, you know what they did? They carried both coaches on their shoulders off the field after winning the Super Bowl. If you're playing with that kind of house money because you're Caleb Williams, guess what? There's nowhere to go but up because nobody's been exceptional since you've been gone or since Jim McMahon has been gone. So I'd say hell with it. Go there. Go, go to, go to Chi-Town and see where it takes you. One of the top markets in the country, by the way. 
Just saying. Just saying. Let me move on to the next subject because this subject harbors a little sensitivity. Sticking with the NFL. Former Patriots head coach Bill Belichick is being defended by former players Devin McCourty and my buddy Rodney Harrison after what they perceive to be a negative depiction of Belichick in, quote, the Dynasty series on Apple TV, end quote. The 71-year-old led the Patriots to nine AFC championships and six Super Bowl titles during his tenure in New England as their head coach. But take a listen to what these guys had to say after watching the series, courtesy of Pro Football Talk. I felt like I got kind of duped. I was like, man, this is going to be great. Like the storytelling, we're talking about this and we're talking about that. Everything that we all gave to the 20 years that it encompassed, they only hit anything that was negative. Hey, we won at a high level and guys stayed there. Like I, I could have left two times. I signed back. There's reasons why. Like they act like the last three or four years because the Patriots have struggled that Bill can't coach. Bill made some mistakes and he wasn't always the nicest or the purest guy. But at the end of the day, he always did whatever he, did, whatever he had to do to make the team better. Think about this. He gave me an opportunity, a fifth round draft choice. He gave Tom Brady an opportunity. He set on a hundred million dollar quarterback when no one thought it was popular and started Tom Brady. Malcolm Butler was... Forget undrafted free agent. He was a tryout guy. He gives guys who are the underdog an opportunity. No one talks about that. When everybody else is done with a guy, he brings in a Corey Dillard. He brings in a Randy Moss. He brings in a Rodney Harrison. And I just don't think that he got enough credit, enough respect, enough props. Man, this dude is the greatest coach of all time. Let me say this. I don't know McCourty that well, even though I've seen him on a couple of occasions. I thought he did a really good job on NBC Sunday Night Football this year. If I remember correctly and Rodney Harrison I've known for years it's one of my brothers I love him dearly and he's a brilliant football mind and I got a lot of respect and love for him and what he's accomplished as a player and when he speaks I listen when it comes to football if that's what they're saying I'm rolling with them but I want to make sure that everybody understands including Rodney Harrison and Devin McCourty what's transpiring with Bill Belichick no one with sense knows or fails to know that Bill Belichick is the greatest coach of this generation and arguably the greatest coach of all time. Bill Belichick has proven his greatness. That is not to be questioned. That, in my opinion, is not why he's out of a head coaching job. He's out of a head coaching job because he's so brilliant and so accomplished, there's a new generation that has come in play. These are younger individuals that have dominion over football operations. They've waited a lifetime to get this opportunity. If you're a young brother in your 40s or your 50s or somewhere along those lines, you really, really think that Bill Belichick is going to listen to you? They don't believe that. They believe he's forgotten more football than they know. He's accustomed to being a boss. And because he's accustomed to being a boss and he had no problem being truculent or acerbic or aloof at his, at his pleasure, Throughout his career in New England, their mentality is it's not going to be any different if we hand him the reins now. Why put ourselves in that situation? We're not going to be able to tell him anything. We're not going to be able to make any suggestions. I'm not saying that's true. I'm saying that's the perception that they probably hold because they don't have the appreciation for Bill Belichick like a Devin McCourty or Rodney Harrison has. And as a result, they're looking at their own tenure and their own viability and their own, you know, path towards success that they're, that they're aspiring to achieve. And their mentality is, yo, I'm not taking that chance. I'm not bringing in somebody that you can't tell anything to that's accustomed to being a boss, that's accustomed to running things, not just as a coach, but as a GM as well. They ain't trying to hear that. They're like, I'm looking out for my own future, and I'm not going to bring him in. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I don't blame those guys for that. If you're in Atlanta or some other franchise, here's who I do blame. The Dallas Cowboys should have hired Bill Belichick. The Dallas Cowboys, not that Mike McCarthy should have been fired because they lost a playoff game to Green Bay. None of that. Mike McCarthy should have been gone because a six-time Super Bowl champion was on the market, who is the antithesis of everything that goes on in Dallas right now. You want to talk, talk, talk all day long, and you want the cameras magnified on you, particularly after games. And you got players distracted. Remember, Demarcus Lawrence and others have spoken about the distractions that exist in Dallas and how every game is like a Super Bowl. 
And as a result, it gets a bit exhausted. Well, guess what? You got to have a coach that knows how to reel you in as players and focus on a level of discipline that you should be exercising. So you're not distracted. Or you're not talking about being tired come playoff time and all of this other stuff. You don't have relatives for the quarterback, like, like Tad Prescott, the brother of Dak, talking about the Eagles, our first-class organization, and the Dallas Cowboys, and implying that the Dallas Cowboys ain't all that. Or the family members going off about them losing in the playoffs and how they need to move on. No, you got a coach that's going to have them focus on football and let the owner talk all day, all, all night long, and it's not going to affect the team. That's what you want. That's what Dallas didn't have. That's what they need, a Bill Belichick. That's what they need. But it didn't happen. And that's why I believe Bill Belichick is out of a job now, because anybody else, they don't want that. It's just that simple. Let's get to the NBA, where Nikola Jokic scored 35 points and pulled down 16 rebounds as the Nuggets survived the Timberwolves' comeback last night in Minneapolis. Anthony Edwards, one of my favorite players, if not my most favorite player, outside of Steph Curry, of course. He scored 30 points, missed a late chance to force overtime, by the way, though, when his attempted three-pointer hit the rim. Look, the brother's the future. He's a Skywalker. He's got a football body. He's physical, he's dynamic, he's a skywalker, he can ball, he's got moxie, he's got box office appeal, he's got the goods. Anthony Davis is that dude. It just ain't enough to offset what Denver's trying to do. They're the reigning defending NBA champions, and this dude, Nikola Jokic, he can't jump onto a damn curb, and you can't stop him. He's just unbelievable. You can't stop him. Two back-to-back, back-to-back three-pointers last night, helping to seal a deal. Contavious Caldwell Pope hitting a three, that helped as well. Michael Porter Jr., his brother something else. He was aggressive last night. Him and Jokic combined for seven for seven shooting and 22 points in the fourth quarter. This is what they bring to the table. And if Michael Porter Jr. is shooting the ball the way he shot last night in Minnesota, nobody's gonna beat, nobody's gonna beat Denver. But I believe that's an aberration. I don't believe that's gonna happen too often. So when I'm looking at the Denver Nuggets, I think the ideal opponent for them is the Boston Celtics. That's what it should have been last year. We all knew that Miami was simply too small for Denver. That is not the case for Boston. Boston, in Porzingis, in Horford, in Tatum, in Brown, in White, in Holiday. Excuse me. Boston's got a chance. I know they lost two games to Denver. I know. I'm fully aware of that. They lost two games to Denver. I get it. But let me tell y'all something right now. I believe... If you really, really think about it and you really pay attention, I believe that the Boston Celtics have all the tools in place to beat the Denver Nuggets. I'm not saying I'd pick them to win, though. I'm not so sure. It'll be be close, though. I definitely think it would be a seven-game series. I'll tell you that much. And it'll be real interesting to see what happens. Denver and Boston seem on a collision course. I'm not that happy about it because we all know I'd rather be in Southern California or Miami for the finals, but I can't get everything I want. Anyway, before we go to break, I gotta get to another subject because it's necessary. And it's necessary, ladies and gentlemen, because I know what I saw. I saw what everybody else saw. Was anybody else watching that atrocity of a performance by the Virginia Cavaliers last night against Colorado State in the start of the NCAA tournament? People were already questioning how they made the tournament. I'm talking about Virginia here. And those people were proven right with a final score of 67 to 42 that somehow did not represent how awful Tony Bennett's squad was. Let me put this in perspective for y'all. Virginia scored 14 damn points in the first half. They went scoreless for the final nine minutes and 20 seconds and also went without a field goal for the final 10 minutes and 30 seconds. They were atrocious, atrocious. And I know that Virginia is only a couple of years removed from winning a national title. I get that. But can I say this to y'all? Because somebody's got to say it, so I'm going to say it. Tony Bennett's beloved, incredibly nice guy, knows what he's doing as a coach, national champion as a coach. I get all of that. But in life, particularly in the world of entertainment, Do you know what's a fireable offense? Boredom. When you're boring as hell. And that's what Virginia is. 14 points and a half. 
Without a field goal for 10 minutes or 30 seconds, do you realize in real time the Virginia Cavaliers went a full 54 minutes without scoring? 51, I apologize. 51 minutes without scoring a basket. 51 minutes! Now that shit is just embarrassing. It just is. There is something to be said about you being a part of a sport and having an obligation to entertain, yet flagrantly displaying the inability to do so. Now, if y'all are satisfied with watching the kind of stuff you saw last night, go at it, go, have at it. But Tony Bennett, respectfully, sir, it's a fireable offense. You shouldn't lose your job because you don't know basketball. You shouldn't lose your job because your team lost an NCAA tournament game. You shouldn't lose your job for those reasons. You should lose your job because your team, coached by you, appears to be the perfect remedy for insomnia. You are boring as hell. Very, very difficult to watch. Why don't we just look, put little kids on the floor that crawl around you can, you can barely lift a basketball. Why don't we watch them? That would have been more entertaining than watching your team. That's all I want to say about that. That's all I want to say. Coming up next, right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, it's looking more and more like the NBA playoffs could be without LeBron James and Stephen Curry. All that, plus former President Donald Trump, implies this year's election is already rigged. Really? All that and more up next. You're watching the Stephen A. Smith Show over the digital airways of YouTube. Back with more in a minute. Okay, everybody, you know what time it is. It's time for Stephen A's Weekly Picks. I've teamed up with Prize Picks to bring you my favorite sports picks each and every single week. Not sure if y'all know this, but Prize Picks is a skill-based, real-money, daily fantasy sports game where you select two or more players and choose if they will have more or less of their predicted in-game stats. But the part that gets me super excited is that you can pick and choose from any and all of the sports you love to watch. That's basketball, that's baseball, that's soccer, that's MMA, even darts. And if you go to prizepicks.com right now and use promo code SAS, you'll receive a 100% deposit bonus up to $100. You heard me right now. Go to prizepicks.com. Type in my initials SAS to get a first-time deposit match up to $100. Today, however, I am not selecting a sport. Today, I'll be choosing more or less than 0.5 times you should hit the snooze button on your alarm when you're getting up in the morning, okay? My theory, you should hit that button more than 0.5 times in the morning. You see, when you're sleeping well, you get that REM sleep, you understand? Where the fatigue and all of that stuff is just, it's just addressed and ultimately evaporates because you're giving your body that true rest that it deserves. Getting up is hard. The first time that snooze button goes off, boom! You hit it, okay, now I'm waking up, okay? Now you should set it, say about 10, 15 minutes later because by this time, even though you're still out, you're getting up a little bit because your sleep has already been interrupted. And then bam, it goes off again. And you hit it a second time. Now you're up. Not fully up, but you know it's time to get up. And that's really all you want. So for me, I hit it a minimum of two times. Two times, not 0.5 times. That's not even once. That don't even count. That don't make any sense. Of course, the answer is more. More than 0.5 times snoozing your alarm when you're getting up in the morning. Take it from your boy, Stephen A. You know I'm an energizer buddy, right? I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't get my sleep. Trust me. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. On Monday, I told you about the launch of LeBron James and J.J. Reddick's new podcast called Mind the Game. Well, the first episode is out, and I've got some thoughts on their discussions on players that have had the biggest impact on the game of basketball. Before I do, take a listen to this. Steph and Allen Iverson are the two biggest influential guys in our game since 
since I've been watching and covering it, you know? One, they're 6'3", six, 6'4", six, if you want to... Steph's not 6'4". If, <laughs> if you want to look on the back of a basketball card, you know, you're, you're always a lot taller on the back of the, on the, back of the basketball card. You know, Allen Iverson and Steph, they were just so relatable. And kids felt like they could be them. They were their, they were guys that was not always counted on. They were small in stature. And they just def, defined the odds. So you got AI who's like unbelievable crossover, corn rolls, arm sleeve. We wear arm sleeve. Everyone wears arm sleeve now because of Allen Iverson. Mm-hmm. And he's going in the trenches, you know, laying it up over bigs, whatever the case may be. And now you have Steph who's shooting over the Empire State Building. You know, it's just like those two are the two most influential. When you say the game, how they change the game and the kids and, and like – those are two guys that you just wanted to watch every single night. I disagree. I disagree. But respectfully, I want to say that. I get exactly where LeBron James is coming from in terms of AI's impact, Steph Curry's impact. You got cats out there you can reach out and touch. You see Allen Iverson walking around, you're going like, I'm taller than him. I'm bigger than him. Maybe I could do what he could do, even though you couldn't. So it, what he was relatable in that regard. Steph Curry, okay, I don't have to be six feet six. I can jumping out of the gym, doing all of this other stuff. No, I don't have to do that. I could just shoot the basketball. I think I could pull that off. So that relatability factor, LeBron James is absolutely right. But here's why I would challenge LeBron James and say there are two people that I would put above those two. One would be Michael Jordan, and the other would be LeBron himself. Because the day and age that we're living in right now, people are about being entrepreneurs. People are about having their own voice, taking command of their own careers or what have you. We see the Jordan brand worth over a billion dollars. We see LeBron James now in that stratosphere, not to mention the fact that LeBron James was a person that spoke his own mind. That's what we have to pay attention to. A lot of folks are following LeBron and MJ more than AI and Steph. Just pay attention. And you can see it. Let me move on to this next subject, sticking with LeBron and the Steph theme. We may have a a big problem on our hands, y'all. Take a look at these standings in the Western Conference. Right now, the Lakers and the Warriors hold the ninth and 10th seeds respectively, which means we could be looking at an NBA playoffs devoid of both of these superstars. If the play-in tournament started today, the Lakers would host the Warriors in the 9 versus 10 game, and the loser of that game would be eliminated. I don't know about anybody else, but this is not good news for the NBA. First of all, let's call something, let's call something out right now. The NBA hasn't done the greatest job in the world of preparing the basketball world for life beyond LeBron and Steph. They are praying that at least one of those dudes advance and go beyond the first round of the playoffs. We're talking about the possibility right now of LeBron and Steph not even making the playoffs because the 10th seed, the winner, the 9, the 10th seed, of course, if 9, 10th seed's going together, 10th seed is out. If the loser is out. And then the winner still has to go against the loser of the 7, 8 seed to make sure they qualify for the playoffs. So it's entirely plausible at this moment in time, LeBron and Steph could both be gone. But just think about it for a second here. In the play-in tournament right now, today, if it was happening today, Luka, Kyrie, KD, Booker, LeBron, AD, and Steph, all in a damn play-in game. That is not good, which is why I couldn't wait to talk to my next guest. He's the host of the Good Word podcast on Yahoo Sports Ball Don't Lie channel. He's also a writer at Yahoo Sports and host on SiriusXM's NBA radio. The brother's an up-and-coming star. He does great, great work covering the NBA. He's my, long, he's my little young buddy, the one and only Vince Goodwill. What's going on, big time? How are you, man? How's everything? Hey, my debut on the Stephen A. Smith show, man. I appreciate it, man. How you doing? Well deserved, my brother. Well deserved. Good to see you. I, you just heard me talking about LeBron, Steph, KD, Booker, uh, uh, Kyrie, Luca, AD, LeBron. And we're talking about possibly four of those stars not even making it into the playoffs. How bad is that for the NBA? Well, it depends on how you look at it, Stephen okay. A. If you okay. look at it and say that... 
the play-in numbers, those ratings, those those like March Madness. You know what I mean? Like That's it's true. the NBA's version of March Madness. Those one-game rating sample sizes will be great. But, yeah, it won't be great to see LeBron or, or and Steph being on the sidelines for the playoffs. But, Stephen A., at some point, the NBA is going to have to transition to its next generation, to Anthony Edwards, to Shea Gilgis-Alexander, to embrace Nikola Jokic. At some point, this change is going to have to be made to the next guys, and they can't let go of Steph. They can't let go of LeBron. You see it every Saturday night. We're getting some combination of Kevin Durant and Giannis or LeBron and Steph. Like, the league won't introduce the new generation until they have to. And usually, you know this, Stephen A., from history, you don't hand the mantle over to the next generation. They snatch it. And these young guys are snatching it right now. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think they should snatch it. I think Anthony Edwards could snatch it. I think Shea Gilgis Alexander could snatch it. Don't tell me Devin Booker can't stand it. We know what a rough rider he is. I get all of that. I guess what I'm saying is this, though. The fact that those guys won't even be participating, you're talking about three or four of those guys not even participating in the first round of the playoffs, is not a great thing. But I will concede this. Kyrie's left-handed hook, you know, from the free, from the free throw line against Denver the other, uh, uh, this past Sunday. That definitely helped. Anthony Edwards put it on the show he's been putting on this week, even in a loss to Denver last night. That helps. So I do think those were both nationally televised games. Maybe the NBA is finally gravitating to that and making sure they're, they're, they're going about the business of promoting a new breed. Are you feeling that way at all? Absolutely. And I do think there's value, Stephen A., if LeBron and Steph are in the playoffs and you see Anthony Edwards, you see those young dudes take it from him. Like, Stephen, I know you're big on boxing. Remember Muhammad Ali fighting Larry Holmes, yeah. and it didn't look pretty, but you got to see the changing of the guard in basketball and boxing. But sometimes it's going to be violent. It's going to be the old guys looking older. Steph and LeBron are having such miraculous years for their ages. But they can only help their teams win but so much. Stephen A, that speaks to the talent in this league. That speaks to the reverence that we have for them. But I don't know if these young guys have the reverence for LeBron and Steph and KD. They look at them and say, you know what? We can make our mark off of these dudes. If they want to come in a seven-game series, we'll knock their asses out. I think that's a beautiful transition of power in the NBA. If, it's, if it should happen. I think it's a beautiful transition as well, as long as they get there to get knocked out. If they're gone before you get an opportunity to get your hands on them, it's a different animal. But let me switch to Anthony Edwards, because when I think about young bloods on the come up, the new breed, who's that, per, who's that person that can take that mantle and take it to another level? That is the name I first come up with. May not have the consistency that Shea Gilgis Alexander puts on display, but the combination of his greatness, his skill set, his athleticism, along with his personality, Personality. I think Anthony Edwards is that perfect guy. The only knock I have against him, Vince, is the fact that he came playing around All-Star Weekend. And when you're that next dude, you got to seize those moments, even in an exhibition-type atmosphere, just to let the world know, put him on notice, oh, I'm the real deal, and I'm coming for that mantle. How did you feel about him during All-Star Weekend and passing that up? Steve, I was disappointed. Because I felt like it was the opportunity that was just sitting right in front of him. And I do think to some degree it stems from LeBron James treating the dunk contest like it was something that wasn't really important. Then that trickles down to the next generation. But at some point it's going to have to change if we're going to continue this. Anthony Edwards, you brought up Shea Gilgis Alexander. The thing for Anthony Edwards is, you know, the personality is one thing. But Stephen A., He's an American-born ball player. Right. We don't have those dudes anymore. You think of the last five or six MVPs. They've all been foreign players. LeBron, Steph, they're aging out. Kevin Durant, they're aging out. You need to have an American-born basketball player with the charisma, who has the sort of agenda to want to embrace all this stuff. Like Stephen A., we see so much of these guys, so many of these guys on Instagram, on Twitter, but we don't know anything about them. You know, their, their images are so carefully constructed that you don't actually get a chance to know who they are authentically. I feel like with Anthony Edwards, you see the joy that he plays with. You see sort of that youthful exuberance that he displays on the floor and even some of the innocence. And I think that's something the NBA needs to wrap its arms around. They need to go to Anthony Edwards and his people and say, hey, this is important, not just for you, but for the entire NBA. Because we don't know what we can expect from John Moran, because Zion Williamson is just starting to figure things out, Anthony Edwards is the last guy of the young guys 
that the NBA can really look at mm-hmm. and say, we're going to market everything around you. And I don't know about you, Steve. Does it look like the Ant-Man? I don't say he plays like him, but does the Ant-Man move like Michael Jordan? Yes. You know what I mean? Like the fluidity. He moves like him. Nobody's ever moved like Jordan. I feel like this dude is as close to anybody as far as just how he moves, how easy, how Listen, fluid he is on the floor. I'll bring three names into it. Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Vince Carter. I think it's it's meshed in. This brother's athleticism is off the chart. And God help the rest of the NBA if he develops a consistent three-point shot. God help the rest of the NBA. I mean, he shoots better than 37%. Missed a couple last night that he could have made, should have made, but that's neither here nor there. I'm going to bring up a subject, and I had no intentions of bringing up this subject in regards to Ja Morant, but I have to. I know he's injured. He's out for the season, not throwing any any shade on him wishing him luck the NBA is better when John Morant is on the court balling no question about that having said that because of these young thoroughbreds on the come up it sort of feels like John Morant missed the window because of the troubles he got himself into and then the injury that followed it's not to say he's not gonna come back on the court and wreak havoc and do his thing but it was his It was his, and everybody would have been looking up at him. Now he's got to come back next season and remind people, in my mind, of what he once was just to be in that pack, in that conversation. That's the feeling I get when I think about John Moran and a missed opportunity. What about you? I agree with you. Think about this, and not just from the NBA standpoint, Stephen A. When we think about some of the great marketing that the league has had, it wasn't the league doing the marketing. It was Nike doing it. John Moran has a Nike shoe that Nike can't really market, A, because John Moran isn't on the floor, and B, because of there's this stink around him because of his behavior and the unfortunate things that he's been involved with. And now he can't even redeem himself on the floor and make you forget about those things. And that window is open, and it closes really quick. This world moves faster than ever, quicker than ever. You have a very small window to make a first impression with the American people. And Josh's first impression was really good until we got to know more. And now we're at the point where, yes, yeah, Steve, we're going to forget about Josh. Not that we're going to forget about him. Josh has work to do. And it's not that he can't do it, but he's fighting from behind. He's fighting from the momentum. God forbid the Minnesota Timberwolves make it to the Western Conference Finals. Right. And you get to see Anthony Edwards every other night in May when the weather gets warm and there's fewer games and you get to see that smile and that personality. That was supposed to be Ja Morant. You got to see Ja and his dad and all that. And then we found out that they were all overexposed and we had to pull it back some. Now you're going to have a risk of, do we put that camera back on Ja? Do we invest in him? Do we want to put that equity in him? not knowing whether he's grown or matured from his previous transgressions. I'm a grown-ass man, so I'm going to acknowledge when I made a mistake or when it's time to move on to another narrative. And when it comes to Kyrie Irving, it's right where I want it to be. We ain't talking about no off-the-court stuff. We ain't talking about him not showing up to work. We ain't talking about him missing games. We ain't talking about headlines that he don't need to be associated with. We're talking about one of the most brilliant offensive magicians this game has ever seen. I'm thinking about the days of Nate Tiny Archibald to the days of Isaiah Thomas to Allen Iverson himself. I'm looking at the great small guards this game has ever seen and Kyrie is up there if not at the very top of that conversation looking at him right now the way that he is playing with Luca doing what we know Luca can do what can the Dallas Mavericks do this year hey we've had conversations about teams like the Boston Celtics having trouble in crunch time and looking at Jason Tatum's numbers and saying Jason, you haven't made the shots when it came down to it, right? The Dallas Mavericks don't have that problem. They have Kyrie Irving, who in the crunch time is like 18 of 31, and he can shoot from different angles. And we've seen what he can do in the NBA Finals in the game seven on the road. He's still that player. He's fearless, and he's unguardable. And you're right. He has the Isaiah Thomas skill set with the Rod Strickland Packets finishing underneath the rim with the with the Kenny Anderson handles. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he from a basketball player, you build Kyrie Irving from the ground up. You actually couldn't build Kyrie Irving from the ground up. Steve, I play basketball left-handed, and I couldn't do what that man did right. with that leaning left-hander. I mean, they are going to be so dangerous. If you put them in a first-round playoff series against the Oklahoma City Thund- Thunder, a team that's light, a team that's young, a team that's going to be satisfied with just getting the number one seed. And you put Luka Doncic on the road 
in a situation where he can steal a game and Kyrie Irving in a situation where he's the secondary option, nobody would want to see those two in a close game. And to me, that's scary. Mm. What should it say to us that nobody minds seeing LeBron James and Anthony Davis? Well, LeBron is old and Anthony Davis can get hit in the face. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it just comes down to Stephen A. It just comes down to that, it, right? Like that, but that's just what it is. And and I do think, Stephen A., there will come a point where the league has to move on from LeBron, and you want Anthony Davis to take that mantle. We've been asking Anthony Davis, make this to your team, make this your franchise, make this your league. It hasn't happened despite the fact that he's played a number of games this year and played at such a high level. And if it's just going to be that way, then the Lakers are going to wind up being a team that other teams look at and say, whether they're in the play-in, whether they're in the playoffs, we're not afraid of going into L.A. We're not worried about them coming into our building. If LeBron scores 40, oh, well, so be it. Like, that's the worst thing you can Mm -hmm. be is a historical player that nobody cares if you drop 40 because they're not fearful that you can actually beat them. Two more questions before I let you get on out of here. You brought up Jason Tatum a bit earlier. Um, He was my league MVP until he went out there and didn't get it done against the Denver Nuggets, losing two games. And then we know Jokic is climbing the ladder. We see what Anthony Edwards is doing. He's in an MVP conversation. Shea Gilgis, Alexander, I'm going to keep mentioning that name again because of the model of consistency that he's put on display. But Jason Tatum, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that the Denver Nuggets are going to win the championship this year. They're the reigning defending champions. They're the best, no doubt about it. They beat the Boston Celtics, the best record in the NBA thus far this year, in the two times they played them. But Tatum and Jalen Brown with Porzingis, with an elite defensive backcourt in White and Holiday, I'm not ruling out that Boston can win the chip. You look at Jason Tatum specifically and the Boston Celtics from a macro perspective. What are your expectations? Stephen, you named all the players who play. You named all their good players, but you can't name their seventh and eighth man. We're talking about Sam Hauser, Peyton Pritchard, God bless them. But I think you're taxing. You're putting too much on their top six players. You're putting too much on a guy like Jason Tatum to produce late in games. It's almost like he's trying to produce his Kobe Bryant Mamba moments late in games, and those shoots don't fit him, as great of a player as he is. Now, Steve, if you tell me the Boston Celtics blow everybody away, that the regular season is the regular season, they continue that during the playoffs because they outshoot you, they can defend you at all these different levels, I'm with you. But if you tell me they're in close game after close game and that three-point shooting can go up and down in the playoff series, Stephen A., who's to say that they get – to the East, through the Eastern Conference Finals in a very weak Eastern Conference. I don't think there's a guarantee they even get to the finals. Mm. Last question for you. We started off this discussion with me talking about LeBron James and J.J. Reddick's podcast, Mind the Game. You and I have been covering basketball for years, along with a plethora of our contemporaries and what have you. How big of a deal is this to see LeBron James doing a podcast on basketball particularly with a mind like J.J. Reddick, who obviously calls NBA games for ABC and ESPN and does an outstanding job as a member of the ESPN family. What are your thoughts about them doing the podcast, and how do you think it's going to resonate with folks? I'm very curious of of the visual element of it, Stephen A., because you can explain basketball. Like, me and you have sat at the feet of some of the best coaches in the history of the league, and they could explain basketball in such a way that was digestible towards us because we were basketball minds. But if they're talking to the masses, you've got to find a way not only to reach them, but to entertain them. If you talk over their heads, you're going to lose the connection with them. I think it's interesting that LeBron James is entering the podcast space. But Stephen A., you know, like I know, LeBron James is always interested in controlling the narrative. I wonder what the narrative is going to be here. Not necessarily a negative agenda, but what's the narrative that he's going to try to push coming out of this podcast? If there's a visual element, I'm all for it. It's like Kobe Bryant and ESPN's detail and some other guys who explain the game really, really well. But I'm wondering what LeBron James's narrative is going to be coming out of it. Well, the part of it that makes me laugh, Vince, is that if you know LeBron and him controlling the narrative, I'm certainly not knocking him. I'm looking forward to the podcast. I'm rooting for them. I hope they do very, very well with it, which I anticipate they will. I think they picked up like 200,000 200, subscribers in day one. So major, major props. Once again, LeBron James making his voice heard and making his presence felt. The interesting part is they possibly think, or LeBron possibly thinks, that's going to shut people up. What he doesn't realize is all it's going to do is create more questions and more dialogue. So thank you, LeBron James, for entertaining us all and providing even more equipment. Vince Goodwill, appreciate you, my brother. Thank you so much, my man. Keep doing a great job you've been doing, all right? We'll talk soon. Hey, can I say one thing to you, yes, Stephen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's up? 
I don't know if people understand this. People like Stephen A., Michael Wilbon, David Aldridge, Rob Parker. I've learned at the feet of these gentlemen throughout my entire career, their encouragement, like sometimes kicking you in the ass a little bit. <laughs> I, every time I've had a career decision, I've called Stephen A. Smith. And every time Stephen A. has told me, in no uncertain terms, you better take that damn job. So, Steve, <laughs> I appreciate you, my man. Love you. Congrats Love you, on bro. everything. All the best, man. Love you too, my man. We'll talk soon. You take it easy, Vince. Until next yes, time. Yes, sir. Still to come right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Donald Trump claims this year's presidential election will be rigged. So why even show up to vote, y'all? Why even show up to vote? Plus, on my last show, I questioned why I still have not been given a skin in Fortnite. Where is it? I want it, all right? But that may be about to change. That might be about to change. That, your calls and tweets up next. This is Stephen A. Smith Show. Don't go away. Let me take a second to remind everybody out there that right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, I demand excellence. And I will never, ever settle for anything less. And that is why I've teamed up with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, which will help turn all of your sports knowledge into some big time money where the money reside. Prize Picks is the daily fantasy app where you simply choose two or more of your favorite players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and then submit your entry in less time than it'll take for Caitlin Clark to pull up and hit a long range game winning three, y'all. Prize Picks allows you to play on every basket, rebound, and assist, or better yet, a combination of all three. So download the Prize Pick app today and join a community of more than three million members. And if you do, Prize Picks will match your first time deposit of up to $100. Yeah, that's right. You heard me. So go to prizepicks.com right now and use code SAS. That's my initials, y'all. My initials, in case you didn't figure that out. Just use promo code SAS on Prize Picks to receive a first deposit match of up to $100 and then let the games begin. Prize Picks! Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Before I get to the latest on me being properly honored by the folks at Fortnite, I need to address something written in the Wall Street Journal today about former President Donald Trump, the GOP nominee at the moment, by the way. Today, Mariah Timms wrote that while Trump's repeated false claims about how the 2020 election was stolen from him may play well at his rallies, they could pose a real threat to Republican turnout during this year's election. I think that's a valid point. Donald Trump is already on the record. See, this is the problem. This is why, just so y'all know, I support the opponent for Donald Trump, Joe Biden, despite the fact that he's going to be 82 years of age and you got the Dems begging for four more years for him. Don't get me started with that. But this is why I believe you cannot support this man. Before a vote has been cast, before election day has arrived, he's telling you, I need you to show out in droves because we got to win by huge, huge numbers because it's rigged. In other words, there's no way on earth he could possibly lose. Never that, never let. I absolutely, without question, I could never lose. That's what he's saying. And as a result of that, you know what that's going to translate into. You know it's going to translate into volatility. If he loses, he's going to claim that it was rigged, that ultimately your vote doesn't count, and people are going to be in an uproar. This is my problem. Donald Trump has proven yet again why I think he is dangerous in the worst possible way, because he can't accept a loss. It's impossible for him to fathom that he actually lost even when he knows he did in 2020. Instead, he's telling you in advance, if I don't win this election, you know it's rigged. There's no way that I lost. And I know he's gonna lean on the notion that he said to everybody, or he's gonna leave, lean on, a, you know, just the literal interpretation of his words, you gotta get out and vote in droves because I have to win big, because anything close, you know it's rigged. In the end, he knows better than most that the word rigged is going to stand out above anything else. The man did have the apprentice years ago. He knows a thing or two about television, about impacting the minds of other folks. He does know these things. 
And as president of the United States, let's face reality, his press conferences were must-see television half the time because he was going to say something provocative, incendiary, insulting, but it was going to be magnetic nevertheless because you wanted to see what he was going to do next. It's like waiting for that damn truck accident to take place, that car crash to take place. That's what you were waiting for with him. And this is no different. It's rigged in advance. Seven and a half months in advance, it's already rigged. That's what he's doing. He's setting the stage for. And we all know that if that happens again and he starts preaching about that stuff again, it's not going to be peaceful for anybody. It's going to be problematic for this country, this nation. And he clearly doesn't give a damn if he doesn't get what he wants. That is my problem with that man, Donald Trump, above all else. Now, before... I get to your tweets and calls for the day. I need to take a moment to showcase one tweet I received since our last show. You might recall I called on the people at Fortnite to create a Stephen A. skin. I want my own skin, all right? Well, one X user gave us a sneak preview of what that might look like, y'all. Take a look at this from at Moisty Media. This is exactly what I've been waiting for. Hmm, let's look at this right here. Where we land in Stephen A, I'm gonna go with Tilted Towers. Where the party's at? Where the party's at? I'm going with Tilted Towers. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> now, I like this. I don't like the way it looks. I think I look a little better than this. I really, really do. But I do like the look. I do like the look. I like the dancing. I like the fact that it got out the plane, was flying and stuff like that, parachuting rather. I understand all of that. Me personally, it would look a little bit lighter. The hairline is accurate. I can't deny it. I can't deny it. But I still think I look a little better than that, okay? I like the suit and tie on, the whole bit. Why I got to be a parachute, though? Why can't I just know how to fly? Why can't I do that? I can have anything I want, right? I want to be able to fly. You know, two of my favorites. When you talk about Marvel characters and stuff like that, all these animated stars and stuff like that, Superman and Aquaman. Either I could fly or I could patrol the seas. That's what I could do. One or the other. Moisty Media, I really, really appreciate this. It was kind of fly the whole bit. I got a goatee, a little mini goatee, not just a stash. You know what I'm saying? I don't like, you know, hairless face. I like, you know, I like my features and stuff like that. You could have fixed that up. I like the dancing, though. That was funny. My daughters would love something like that. But that works for me. I'm down for it. I'm down for it. Let's modify it just a touch, but let's keep it going. Stephen A. Skin for Fortnite. I'm calling for it. I'm calling for it. Let's get to some of these tweets here before I get to the calls and get on out here for the day, all right? Put up this tweet, please. At Terra B. Knows, do you put your hot dogs in tortillas, tortillas or bread? Who the hell will put their hot dogs in tortillas? What the hell is going on here? And first of all, this is either a pork hot dog or it wasn't cooked at all. I like it. I like beef and I liked it baked on the grill. You understand what I'm saying? That's how I like it. And I would choose bread over, to over tortilla, but I would tell you a, a hot dog bun would be best. But I will tell you this. If you're going to do a bread, you got to toast it. Okay? got to toast it, put a little bit of butter on it. Then, after that, drop some ketchup on one side, mustard on the other. My favorite, though, is sauerkraut. That's what I like on my hot dog, sauerkraut. But that's just me. Next up, what you got here? At CS11, double underscore. Stephen A, who's more likely to drop 90 points in an NBA game? Venom or Spider-Man? Well, this is a hard one, because Venom's a big boy. You understand? Shaq, Will Chamberlain type thing, that's dominant. Spider-Man, I mean, damn, just use the web and, you know, he can do anything, his agility and whatever. I don't know if he could dribble the basketball, though, but he could do a lot of things. Believe it or not, even though this picture depicts something different, I'm going to have to go with Spider-Man. Venom looks like he might get tired. You understand? Or he might foul out due to offensive fouls. Spider-Man will wiggle his way around the defenders and stuff like that. He looks like he'll plow right through them. He might be Shaq against the, Miami, uh, against the Los Angeles Lakers. Remember when Shaq first went to Miami and went against Kobe and the Lakers for the first time since departing from Kobe, and he fouled out of that game? That's Venom right there. 
Spider-Man, bit more abilities. I will go with Spider-Man on this. Spider-Man over Venom for the 90 points. Let's go to the next one, please. Stephen A., this is at Tattooed Pokemon. Hey, Stephen, how many licks do you think it takes to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll pop? <sighs> You're asking me how much, how much licking I actually do? Is that what you're trying to do? You're trying to find that out? You horny bastards? Is that what you're trying to do? You know what I'm saying? Trying to get all personal and stuff like that, trying to find out how I utilize my tongue and what I do and all of that other stuff. That's, what you, that's where you're trying to go. I'm not answering that question. I'm not doing it. Although I think it'd take about 100. But I'm not doing it, okay? Now, it just so happens I like my lollipops, okay? Okay? So I do, I do, but that is not a question you are supposed to be asking me. You understand? Get your mind out of the gutter. Sorry asses. Anyway, next up. Let's go to the last one. At 21 Fazo, who's winning in a fight? The cat or the dog? Well, why wouldn't I say the dog? I mean, that's just me. I know that the cat looks like a dog. I mean, right over here, this looks like a dog. This looks like a cat, but it says the arrow here with the dog and arrow here with the cat. It'll be this one, right? But it's saying that's the cat. I don't believe that's the cat. I really, really don't. I'm going to always... Cat dog, what the hell is it? It's one being? That's what y'all trying to tell me? Who's winning in a fight? Cat dog, they're one? I don't know what to say. If it's one, nobody. You're fighting yourself, right? I don't know what the hell to make of these questions. Y'all send me some silly ass questions sometimes. I don't mind answering them, but help a brother out. Be specific. I don't understand this. I'm always gonna pick the cat over the dog, but if they wanted the same, I don't know what you want me to tell you. I really, really don't know. Let me get to the calls before I get on out of here for the day. 888-SAS-5303, that's 888-727-5303 before we get on out of here. Let's go to Eli in Oklahoma. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Eli, how are you? I'm doing good, Stephen A. I have one question. Okay. Who is your NBA MVP? Mm. You know what? Right now, I would have to tell you it's going to be Jokic. It's going to be between Jokic and Shea Gilgis Alexander. I'll give a nod. Not to in- Shea? Well, I said Jokic or Shea Gilgis Alexander. It's a, it's, it's a race right now. It's coming down to the wire. Shea, the way that he's been performing for Oklahoma City, I can't say enough about him, but the greatness of Jokic can't be escaped. Anthony Edwards was up there, obviously. He's been doing what he's been doing, even without Carl Anthony Towns. But in the end, Oklahoma City and Denver, and the way that they've been balling, I got to give credit to one of those two guys. Shea Gilgis Alexander or Jokic, it's, it's a tight race. I haven't made my decision yet. And I have a vote, just so you know. I do have a vote. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you so much, All Eli. Right. Appreciate you. the call, buddy. Take care. Let's go to Jake in Pennsylvania. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Jake? How are you? Yo, what's up? Am I on the air right now? Yes, you are. You're live right here with yours truly. Talk to me. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, here's the thing. I've got like four grand in savings, and I'm trying to get a job at KD's family's office. Do I spend it all and fly and get front row secrets, or do I like pay my rent? That's my question. So you're saying that you have $4,000 saved yeah, and you're trying to get a job with KD's office? His family office. His family yep, office? Yep, yep, yep. 35 yep, inches? Yep, 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 yep. Okay. And you're saying, what do you do? Spend all your money to go to the game to pay for mm-hmm. a season ticket or do you pay your rent? That's what I'm saying. Yes, sir. Um, you pay your rent, brother. You pay your rent. <sighs> First of all, going to the game ain't no guarantee that you're going to get in front of KD. Secondly, KD ain't in an environment where he's going to entertain business talk with you when he's about handling business on the basketball court. So you going to the game ain't going to help you but so much. Thirdly and more importantly, if you rolled up on me and my place of business to get business with me, I've got personnel to handle that. I'm not interested in talking to you. I'm interested in you talking to folks uh, that work for me. You're supposed to be putting forth your due diligence to find out who those people are. Rich Kleinman and others who work under KD and 35 Ventures, those are the guys that you're supposed to be talking to. KD ain't the one that's going to hire you. It's going to be one of them. 
So that's what you need to focus your attention on. And the first order of business is being able to pay your rent to make sure that you got a place to go and rest your head after you finish going to a damn game or somewhere else. It ain't to blow all your money to get in front of a dude. Could you imagine if you did all of that and then you couldn't even get in front of KD or you did get in front of KD and he dismissed you because he had a basketball game coming up? Could you imagine how you would feel once you did that? You don't put yourself in that position. Don't do that. All right? That's crazy. That's right, crazy. Man. Take it easy, bro. Thank you so much. Mike in New Jersey, you're the last caller. You're live with Stephen A. What's up? What's up, Stephen A.? Talk to me. Um, regardless of the, I would say, super teams they have assembled, what do you think is harder, being a Jets fan or a Clippers fan? Because I'm both. Don't ask how. A Jets fan or a Clippers fan? Yes. Wow, that's a tough one. It is well, very tough. I, I would say this to you. It depends. There's no definitive answer for, to the, for that, for number one. The Jets haven't won a Super Bowl since 1968. Last time they won a Super Bowl, last time they went to a Super Bowl, Joe Namath was wearing tight shorts, and he was, uh, uh, you know, a marketing whiz, you know, nicknamed Broadway Joe because he guaranteed the victory against the Colts in the Super Bowl and ended up delivering on that. So the Jets haven't teased you as much as the Clippers have. On one hand, they've disappointed you year after year after year. I know they've been to a couple of AFC championship games with Bill Parcells and then ultimately with Rex Ryan, but you knew they weren't those dudes. You knew they weren't the team to beat. In the case of the Los Angeles Clippers, they had Lob City with CP3, Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan. They've had Kawhi Leonard and Paul George for years. They got to the Western Conference a couple of years ago for the first time. And, and since Kawhi Leonard has arrived, you've always had the impression that if he's healthy, that the Los Angeles Clippers could win something for you. The problem is he always gets hurt. And so that has been torture. So I would tell you it's all about how you look at it in that regard. All right? Appreciate all right, it. Trust man. me. All Have right, a good man. one. Thanks a lot, bro. Appreciate you. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, hope you enjoyed the show. That's it for this edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. I'll be back in a couple of days. But until I am, let me say goodbye. Thanks again to my man Vince Goodwill of Yahoo Sports and Sirius XM's NBA Radio. Appreciate him coming on the show and dropping his knowledge, doing an exceptional job covering the NBA all of these years. And his, and his career is just continuing to climb. Young brother makes me proud all the time. Thanks again to him for coming on the show. Hope y'all enjoyed all the topics that I broached. And look forward to talking to y'all in a couple of days. Until next time, everybody, peace and love. Talk to you later.